Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Brookings. I'm Michael Hanlon with the Foreign Policy Program, and my colleague Molly Reynolds from the Governance Program here at Brookings, and I would like to welcome Patrick O'Brien from the Office of Economic Adjustment at the Department of Defense. We're really pleased to have you here today for a different kind of conversation than I've been privileged to have in my years at Brookings, talking not about some foreign policy crisis in Syria or Afghanistan or Russia, but talking about the impact of the military and military spending here in the United States on our communities, on our economies, on our state economies, on our national economy. And uh, the Office of Economic Adjustment at the Pentagon has just put out really one of my favorite government reports. That may sound like damning with faint praise, but it's a beautiful report, and you've got to check it out if you haven't already. There are some copies here. It's on the web. And what it really does is break down, again, the way in which the defense dollar goes to different parts of the country. Uh, at the regional level, especially at the state level, but also at the county level, and breaking down by different kinds of military spending. In other words, where military personnel and civilian DOD employees are located and, and have their salary uh, and w live their lives with their families, but also where contracts go, contracts to build weapons, contracts to develop weapons, contracts to provide defense services. And it's just a remarkably accessible form of data, which I think is of use not only for understanding the defense dollar, but really for understanding economics and the way our national economy works. And Molly Reynolds uh, is an expert on Congress and on the federal filibuster, a topic she's explored in her, uh, in her book, but also thinks a lot about congressional races and about congressional caucuses and the way different blocks form in Congress and how they vote and what motivates them. And so I'll be delighted after uh, Mr. O'Brien and I begin with a bit of conversation where he's going to frame the report and its main findings to then bring Molly in as well to the conversation before going to all of you. Just one more word on Mr. O'Brien. He's uh, from the great state of Minnesota where he went to college, got a graduate degree at Carnegie Mellon, has worked at the Department of HUD, but also worked locally in economic adjustment in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, and has a wide range of background, therefore, in trying to think of how economies build on their strengths and recover during transition uh, and otherwise utilize the full range of assets at their disposal, which I think really makes him and his team, uh, like my good friend Tara Butler and others in the Office of Economic Adjustment, really well positioned uh, to produce this kind of report. Just one last word of introduction, and then I'm going to just uh, open it up. And again, thank you, uh, Mr. O'Brien, for being here. By the way, thank you all for joining three Irishmen, Irish women, uh, two <laughs> days after St. After Patrick's Day. Uh, and Mr. O'Brien just hosted a big uh, dinner uh, for his uh, community on Saturday, so we're all recovering from Sunday still, trying to keep the St. Patrick's spirit alive. I hope, hope that's true for all of you as well, whether Irish or not. Uh, but let me just say that there are a lot of ways to slice and dice the findings of this report, and a lot of the, a lot of the detail is presented beautifully in map form, as I say, inside its pages. And one of my favorite ways to study the report and to begin to get a sense of where defense dollars are spent, and I think Molly uh, has emphasized the importance of this to me as well, is to think about not only where defense dollars are spent in the greatest quantity, but where they are the largest fraction of a local or state economy. And just to help you begin to establish some uh, mental and conceptual pillars, I'm going to offer one last thought, which is I, as I study the top ten list, I formed some pairs in my head, which I thought were helpful for me to remember where these dollars are most concentrated relative to the size of local and state economies. Hawaii and Alaska, out west. Maine and Connecticut in New England. This area, as you can imagine, with Virginia far and away the uh, number one state uh, spender as a percent of GDP, which is a little almost surprising. We know Virginia has a lot of military capability, but it's also a big state with a big economy, and yet defense is, all, is 9%, almost 9% of its entire economy. Uh, and then uh, Mississippi and Alabama, with a lot of test ranges and air war colleges and other facilities. And then um, uh, Kentucky, sort of the outlier, no, no obvious pair state that I could associate with Kentucky, but the home of the 101st Air Assault Division, among other things and Fort Knox. So um, we can begin to understand the national economy and the way in which defense affects it in these kinds of ways. But I'm now going to turn the floor over to the real expert and first ask you to uh, join me in welcoming Mr. O'Brien and then let, let him say a few words about his nice report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, and the Brookings Institute. I might add, uh, Michael is part of a genre of other analysts that we work with 
And it's through their work, actually, that people become better informed about what's happening with the DOD expenditures. And it's through their work also that people can start anticipating and anticipating what we can do to stay in front of different things that are happening with the defense dollar. So the report that we are talking about today was brought about because of the Budget Control Act of 2011. The Budget Control Act of 2011 changed the way everything happens in DOD. It brought about what's called this, this sequester. So if, if we didn't meet certain budget thresholds, uh, there was going to be an automatic cut brought about. And at the time it was enacted, some people likened it to a meat cleaver, uh, uh, an axe, whatever you want to call it, it was bad because there was no control over what was going to happen if you didn't meet a budget cap. And so we brought in an era that was typified by not having regular appropriations on time. We ended up on continuing resolutions. For those of you that don't know what that means is, we don't end up with a full year of appropriations. So while you're under a continuing resolution, you can't go out and contract for new products, et cetera, so your procurement process starts contracting. And if you have this Budget Control Act and you don't meet your budget caps, you have to turn money back in. So there's this, the, the meat cleaver, as they call it, comes out, and there's a sequester. You have to give up money. And if you don't have enough money to pay people, you sequester people. So th this really hit the wall in 2013. And I don't know if you remember in 2013, uh, we had the ground pilots from training in their flyers. We had to pull people out of boats. We had to tell people to stop training on the ranges, et cetera, because we couldn't pay them to do this. And it created enormous implications for readiness. Well, all those implications are felt locally. And we started getting a lot of requests from the states and communities about, okay, this is happening. We don't know why it's happening, and we're trying to understand it. And so there wasn't one common source that told people where does the defense dollar go. And so we looked at this, and we said, let's start pulling these pieces together. So what you have in front of you today is the outcome of this effort, and it continues to be built upon. So we continue to try to grow it. Michael talked about impacts. We're careful not to represent impacts in that document. What we're trying to represent in that document are expenditures. And those expenditures are coming from some public databases that should be readily accessible to anybody in the public. The difference is we're putting it together to make it easier for people. So if you take a look at that report, the blue sections all represent procurement. And they come from data that we have to report, the department has to provide to what's called usaspending.gov and it reflects what we procure over the course of a fiscal year. Now, the data lags, so what you have in front of you is for FY17. The FY18 data doesn't become available until the following March, so this month we expect we'll be getting FY18 data and putting that together. If you take a look at the spending, okay, it's by place of performance. Or, I'm sorry, it's not by place of performance, where the, the, the money is spent or it's sent to. And if it's sent to somebody, then it gets sent out to the place of performance. So there's a little bit of a wrinkle there that I'll address a little bit later. Uh, and you'll notice it talks about companies, and it can talk about locations. The personnel numbers come from the Defense Manpower Data Center. So that's the keeper of all the Defense Manpower numbers. And what we've done in that report is we've represented military personnel, so uniforms. We've represented civilian We've also represented Guard and Reserves. And so in that report, we've also presented uh, gross numbers of employees and the cost or the expenses that we have for personnel in those locations. And if you look on the upper right-hand page of any of those uh, tribe pages that we have, uh, you'll see rankings on a national level where people fall out relative to each other in the nation. So the purpose, again, is to present people with a real-time picture on where the defense money is going. Now, what we're hoping is that people like Michael and a number of you in the audience will pick it up and start drawing upon what is, what's the correlation. What are the relationships that exist across those expenditures? And then start talking about what can we do to look at those expenditures because, let's face it, we brought this out because of the Budget Control Act and because people were worried about impacts locally. Okay, and it's, it's only magnified since then. So since the Budget Control Act started, we probably lost close to $90 billion in defense procurement. So that, those were real losses. 
And so states and communities have been engaged in trying to make themselves and those businesses, those economies, more resilient to those fluctuations in spending. And then we now have further uh, national security needs. So they're looking at artificial intelligence and how do we grow and develop better artificial intelligence around our defense presence. They're talking about cyber security. Uh, we instituted a whole line of new restrictions that if you want to subcontract with DOD, you have to have safeguards in place to protect yourself against cyber attacks. Well, if you're a local official, you don't know what you don't know. And this guide helps you understand where does the money go so that you can then go out and start talking to those locations, to those industries, and understanding, getting a better handle on where it's going. It's fantastic. If we could go through just a couple of the top findings, and I'll just um, I'll take the liberty of, again, amplifying and underscoring and asking maybe to talk about one or two of the states uh, that uh, are in the top ten list. I mentioned before that states that have the highest percentage of spending as a percent of GDP. But let me just read the list that probably some of you have already seen in the press releases or in the report itself on the top ten by absolute dollar magnitude. California is number one by that metric at almost $50 billion with a mix, of course, of a lot of military personnel and a lot of defense industry. Number two is Virginia, not far behind at $46 billion. Texas, $38 billion. Maryland, $21. Florida, $19. Washington State, $15 billion. Remember, this does not include Department of Energy, right? So a big DOE lab is not going to be included in these figures. Connecticut at $15 billion. Georgia at $13 billion. Pennsylvania at $12. Alabama at, at $11. So by the way, there's no obvious correlation of red state, blue state, not that there would be or should be, but it's worth noting you've got, a, you got the, the blue stalwarts of Maryland and Connecticut and, um, and then the uh, swing states of Florida and Virginia and Pennsylvania and the red states of Alabama um, and Texas. And, and then uh, also you have a lot of coastal states, but we also know that some of the uh, key heartland states like Missouri produce a lot of defense equipment or have important bases. So I, I just wondered, uh, when you try to think through the map uh, and the list, what are some of the key points you like to emphasize just to drive home maybe some counterintuitive findings or help yourself sure. remember some of the most important results? So um, a couple of things to keep in mind. First, those top 10 numbers that uh, Michael went through. Proportionally, they continue to have been the top 10 throughout all these reductions in defense spending. It's just that the real expenditures have gone down. And, and what we've seen is, uh, in just about every one of those states, uh, there's been a concern to reach out to understand, do we really lose something when we see that kind of a decrease in spending? So there's been a reach in those states to go out and start identifying not just the primes, not just the subs, but to start looking at the supply chains. So what they've attempted to do is, where does the money go for the actual place of performance of the work being done? And wherever that place of performance is. What about those businesses that are performing? And are they the only manufacturer of a widget so that if there's a, a lapse in defense spending, do they go away? And if they are dependent on that defense spending, is there some kind of business um, enterprise that they can do or extension that they can engage with to help them either expand their technology or the training to make them more resilient? perhaps to diversify their sources of income so that when the defense budget's going like this, they have some other businesses that can chime in. Uh, the personnel numbers are the personnel numbers. The personnel numbers have remained relatively constant. So we haven't seen a big fluctuation with that. Uh, quite frankly, the part that I'm worried about are, is the numbers that are not in the top 10. It's the uh, sometimes the rural areas. It's sometimes the states that don't have necessarily large bulk expenditures, but they have key critical technologies. And those key critical technologies are people paying attention to those. And are they concerned at all about if something happens with the defense money going towards that technology, what happens to it? And I would just bring up an example that we experienced in, uh, in Grand Forks. Uh, there was an Air Force base that was affected by BRAC-05, the base closure rounds of BRAC-05. And basically, we hollowed it out. So we pulled a lot of the, res the mission out of that facility, but we said, you know, they're in an area where there's a lot of land and we want to keep the facility, but we pulled a lot of the economic activity out of it. And the community started looking at it and they said, my God, what are we going to do? And so they identified uh, the UAS, 
the unmanned aerial systems. And so they worked across academia, the private sector, and the communities up there. And they started understanding, okay, the Air Force is up here. This is something that's coming in the future. What can we do to, to in essence, feed the beast? And so if you look what they've got now, they've got a state-of-the-art UAS uh, training facility. They have undergraduate degrees. The Air Force loves them because they're a pipeline to service the Air Force needs for UAS activities. And they're also a test bed for commercial applications of UAS. And the Federal Aviation Administration is working with them. And so, you know, Grand Forks. Now, I come from Minnesota. And, you know, a lot of times you think, you know, you, you get the winters and you get this, this brief period of, of summertime. And what else do you have? Go looking for it. So you want to take a look not just at the top ten. You want to also take a look at some of these other places and say, okay, there's something going on there. What is it? Now, I met with the governors uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was asked, you know, what should we do about this? And, you know, they weren't all top ten defense spending locations. And the, the answer is the same. You've got to start looking and see where's the money going and understand where the money's going. Is there a labor requirement behind it? Is the labor requirement sufficient to meet the future need? Is there more technology coming? Are you able to provide labor for the defense presence, for the expenditures? Same thing happens with defense industry. Okay, if, if we don't continue to innovate, if we don't continue to try to leverage technology, we're not going to do well as a country. So what can you as a governor or as a mayor or your, your analytics folks, what can you do to start understanding how that dollar translates locally? And can you bring forward workforce development opportunities? Can you bring forth other business development opportunities? And the whole idea is, how do you make your local economies more resilient to that defense spending that's going on, and quite frankly, result in a win-win for both the department and the community or state that's affected by it? Thank you. And just to dramatize a point that you alluded to, but your office is, is called the Office of Economic Adjustment. I remember 30 years ago when the Cold War ended, we talked about defense conversion. And we had defense conversion commissions, and we went from close to 6% of GDP to 3% in a fairly short period of time. And as you point out, we've been going down the last decade, but we, we, we were at about 3% through the 90s, went up to 4 4.5% in the uh, Bush-Obama buildup, if you will. Not that those two gentlemen think of themselves as part of the same military plan, but they really did preside over a period in which we went over 4%, and now we're back down in the low threes again, and perhaps headed below that, even if President Trump has increased the defense budget somewhat in recent times. So as you, as you think through this sort of curve of starp, uh, steep decline after the Cold War, gentle rise, more gentle decline since, um, is that why you decided to call your office the Office of Economic Adjustment? And we're not thinking so much about conversion anymore. We anticipate that we're in more of a quasi-steady state, but we still need the raw data to help communities do what you just said. Yeah, I think um, the world has changed. And I think there are some instances out there where uh, industry is, is not going to remain competitive. And some of those areas, you're looking at the need to convert from a defense dependency to some other type of uh, economic activity, or you're going to die. Okay, so, or, or you know, your population is going to get used to seeing home in the rearview mirror as opposed to the windshield. And so uh, defense conversion is still there. But the, the dynamics that we have basically for the last 10 years now is, uh, you know, just think about it once. Uh, the timeline that Michael was referring to, you had a presidential budget that more or less survived a submission to Congress that more or less had an appropriation behind it. And we even, we even had something called the peace dividend at the time. I don't know if you remember the, uh, the good old days. We don't have that anymore. In fact, what we have right now is, I dare you to look at a presidential budget, and it doesn't matter who's in the White House. Look at the presidential budget that represents DOD's requirements. And, you know, first off, you have this Budget Control Act, and how many times is the defense budget request in line with the, defense, with the Budget Control Act? Well, rarely. And then you end up with the budget submission being made, and then people would, okay, let's, let's tear our business decisions off what the president's asking. Well, wait a minute. You can't do that because Congress is going to take that budget request and it may come out as something completely different. 
and that's what's been going on. And they don't decide what they're going to do on time. So then we get that continuing resolution activity that I talked about. So we've condensed the period of time. So defense businesses and industries that are important, they're not trying to convert to a peacetime activity or to non-defense activity. They're simply trying to sustain themselves so they can remain you know, responsive. And the states and communities are hoping they remain resilient so they have a viable economy locally. Uh, everything's distorted. It's messed up. And it, it drives everybody nuts. So our program had to evolve to where we help them look at becoming more resilient. Uh, look at the tank plant in Lima, Ohio. Okay, uh, we ended up seeing some procurement activity coming to an end. And it's not that we didn't need the tank plant. It's not that we didn't need the technologies or the, the skills of that labor force. But because of budget realities, things got distorted. And so what happens? Well, in that case, the community got engaged with the state and they worked with that labor force to give them skills so that when the next army procurement cycle came around, they were able to compete and get right back into what they were really good at. And the department didn't lose it. The states and communities didn't lose it. So uh, we may get back to just being defense conversion, but until we get more normalcy, and I might say some sanity in this budget process that we have, we're in a very uncharted territory, and resiliency is probably the best spot to be in. And quite frankly, everybody wants us to be there because they see what the implications are if we can't get there. That's great. So just two more questions for me, and then I want to bring in Molly and then bring in all of you. Uh, let's talk with the first question a little bit more in detail about personnel, and then the second one a little bit more detail about contracts and where they go geographically. So. I'm on page 15 of the report for those of you who are interested in following along. But as I look at personnel, it's, it's fairly interesting to see where, where the most intense concentrations, and now I'm looking at absolute numbers, not relative to the population of the state, but the eastern seaboard, a lot of, a lot of troops, everywhere from this area down through the Carolinas with Fort Bragg and uh, Shaw Air Force Base and down into Florida, a lot of naval installations, Air Force capabilities, mil military headquarters then relatively strong through the deep south states of Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, a lot of people in Texas, uh, a lot of people in Colorado, a lot in, in um, California and Washington State, Those, and then also Ohio. Those are the densest concentrations. And even New York State, even though New York State with a big economy, uh, defense is not a huge share of the economy, it does have Fort Drum. And so if we think about it, there's really the deep purple is along the eastern seaboard and then Texas, Colorado, California, Washington, and, uh, and Ohio. Uh, the, the center of the country, a little less dense for the most part in terms of personnel, but there are plenty of states that are in sort of that second uh, category, like in Missouri or in Kansas or Oklahoma, uh, Kentucky. So it's, you know, it's really just the northern swath that is relatively underrepresented. Uh, I would say, if I was going to just generalize from this map, especially the center north of the country, everything from Idaho uh, over to the Great Lakes states, uh, Great Lakes states. Uh, any comment that you would make, is, is that the way you look at it when you stare at these personnel numbers? Anything more you'd want to add about how to think about the geographic distribution of military personnel around the country? Yeah, I would probably put it back in the vernacular that I started off with, which is uh, it doesn't matter if you're uh, a dark or a lighter state in terms of the preponderance of spending, you have a presence. And so uh, Montana, for instance, is, is a lightly colored state, but we know there is a major, at least one major Air Force facility up there that's critical to the nation's security. And so I would be careful uh, not to read too much into the coloring in terms of something's good or not, but what I would do instead is if I'm a governor or I'm a local official, I'd want to know, okay, where is that spending going on? And based on where that spending is going on, do I need to do anything to talk about how do I preserve it or how do I make it better? And I, it, you know, it gets back to the, the rural areas. Uh, now, some rural areas see a lot of defense spending, others do not. But those that do not, where it is occurring, you probably have a very important facility or you have an important presence and it's up to these local officials to get a better handle on it. And again, we're not talking about multiplier effects on that chart. We're simply talking about expenditures. When you start applying the multiplier effects, it starts changing things. And those changes 
are what makes this really interesting for the analyst. It makes it really interesting for the public officials that are responsible for those areas because all of a sudden you're talking about livelihoods. You're talking about national security implications. You're also talking about, quite frankly, are you on the top end of this thing or are you back end? And if you're on the back end, what can you do to get on the front end of it? By the way, um, I seem to recall from my CBO days 100 years ago that uh, not a bad approximation for a defense multiplier was something like, even though it varies depending on the kind of spending, of course, 1.7 or 1.8 to 1, is that not, in other words, you get 70 or 80 percent more activity even above the dollar that you spent? Is that? There, there is, but honestly, um, everybody has their own multiplier <laughs> that they, you know, and, and you know, analysts are, are not no different. There's a lot of art to this. There's some science, but there's also a lot of art. Uh, we like to norm to a certain multiplier, and, and that's reasonable. But honestly, uh, at the local level where the rubber hits the pavement, uh, you have a pretty good idea of what's going on, and sometimes you can alter those multipliers, and we don't want to take a stand in that dynamic. We say, you know, at the end of the day, no one knows their economy better than the governors and the mayors and county executives, and so this is the raw data. You guys have at it. By the way, just to underscore again a point that you've been making that uh, Tara's made, uh, the report is beautiful at breaking out by county. So I've been emphasizing at the state level just for the sake of a first cut at this, but you get a lot of county by county uh, graphical and numerical data in, the, in these pages that go into the individual states. My last question, I see on page 14 you've listed uh, nationally the top, well, excuse me, not page 14, not page 12, the, the top defense contractors, Lockheed Martin, number one, at $30 billion or so, Boeing, two, at $22 billion, and then rounding out the big five, General Dynamics, Raytheon, and Northrop Grumman, all between 11 and $13 billion. And then uh, below that, United Technologies, L3 Technologies, BAE Systems, Huntington Ingalls, and Humana. Uh, and when you break out the contract spending state by state, you're not just looking at where the primes are headquartered, right? You're looking at the subcontractor base and where the, the actual spending occurs. Is that a fair way to understand? Uh, I think we're looking at where the spending occurs, but you have this place of performance dynamic. And uh, my staff and I, I want to recognize Les Kimianti, who is sitting up here in the front row, who, who has spent enormous time putting all this together. And she ends up getting calls from me late at night or whatever, asking questions. And she's like, oh, and I, okay. Uh, the reality is... We can track it only so far. So we can track it to a point where it goes. And so we have an example with Electric Boat. So Electric Boat shows up in Connecticut as an expenditure. But once Electric Boat gets the money, they send it to Quonset Point in Rhode Island for some construction activity. And so that activity, once they send it on to Quonset Point, doesn't show up necessarily in the spending data that we have. And that's where governors get involved. That's where local officials get involved. It's, okay, where does the money come from, and how does it filter in? And then do you have the labor supply? Do you have the other activities to continue to feed and maintain it? So there are some uh, constraints to the data. And so we've been careful to try to represent just the raw data. And we actually encourage analysts like Michael and company to get involved, to start looking at the data, and to start helping the others understand just what happens with that money when it goes out. So the dynamic that I mentioned, uh, where it goes to, you know, the money goes to one location, and let's say the company sends it out to other locations, they don't have to report on it. Uh, sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they will talk to you, and sometimes they won't. That's where you make the money at, at the local level as an analyst or as an official, because you care about that. And if there's a problem, or there's a vulnerability, you want to know about it before pink slips are issued or something, at which point you're reacting. So you want to get in front of it. So sometimes the subcontractor expenditure is recognized and acknowledged. Sometimes yes. it's not, depending on the data stream that you've got access to. Precisely. Fantastic. Molly, I, I just would love to hear your reactions. I'm sure that, like me, you're fascinated by this, and you've sort of mapped it in your head against other things you study and know in a million different ways. So rather than try to get... Uh, too sophisticated with my question. Let me just ask you for your reactions to this wealth and this treasure trove of data. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. I want to make a couple of um, 
different kinds of observations. And I want to start by picking up on um, some of the things we've already talked about, about the state of the defense budget. Some of these are mentioned in the report um, in the introduction. So I do a lot of work on the congressional budget process. So I just want to highlight a couple of um, sort of really important contextual pieces of information um, that underlie all of this um, great work. So uh, we've already talked um, a little bit about the Budget Control Act caps um, and their role in determining the overall size of the defense budget. Uh, I just want to highlight that we have two more years under the BCA caps. Um, but we currently lack uh, a budget deal for the fiscal year that begins um, on October 1st, 2019. So basically, since the Budget Control Act was passed in 2011, Congress has looked at those caps, and there's a cap for defense spending, and there's a separate cap for non-defense discretionary spending, and said, you know, these caps are too restrictive. We really want to spend more than they allow us to, so we're going to negotiate a series of two-year budget deals to temporarily raise those caps. The last time Congress did that, it did so only through the end of fiscal year 2019, so only through the end of September. So right now, folks on Capitol Hill are looking at developing appropriations bills, both for the Department of Defense and for the rest of the discretionary budget for the fiscal year that begins in October. And at present, they don't know, you know how big the pie is going to be, and it's really hard to start dividing up the pie into individual segments, individual pieces, until you know how large the pie is going to be. So a lot of this uncertainty um, from the Budget Control Act um, that we've already talked about comes from this dynamic or is exacerbated by the fact that in addition to putting the caps in place in the first place, Congress has periodically uh, decided to raise them, and I think um, the expectation is that they will find a way to do so again, but exactly when that happens and what form it takes is um, really up in the air. It's worth noting that the President's budget proposal, which has come out in kind of a couple of pieces over the past several weeks, um, proposes maintaining the um, caps that are in the original Budget Control Act for defense and non-defense spending, but funneling all of a proposed defense spending increase into what we call the Overseas Contingency Operations, or OCO, uh, portion of the federal budget. That, importantly, is not subject to um, the caps under the Budget Control Act. So there's all kinds of um, stuff that needs to be figured out, but that uncertainty really underlies a lot of um, what we've been talking about. It's also worth noting that this current fiscal year, um, fiscal year 2019, was a little bit of an outlier over the past decade or so for the development of um, and passage of the Defense Appropriations Bill in that the Defense Appropriations Bill was actually finished before the end of the fiscal year. Um, it was completed um, in the fall before the new fiscal year began on October 1st. Um, we can talk, I'm happy to talk at length about kind of why that was. Um, some of it had to do with a conscious choice by um, the Appropriations Committee leadership in the Senate to try and keep as many uh, politically problematic writers or policy provisions out of the appropriations process as possible. Some of it also had to do with a choice by congressional leaders to put that bill, the defense bill, on the floor in conjunction with the bill funding the Departments of Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education. So um, constructing what um, people who watch Congress would call a classic log roll. So getting you know, folks who care a lot about the defense budget but maybe don't care as much about some of the um, non-defense programs to get together with people who care a lot about those non-defense programs. Then everyone goes in on political support for that bill. Um, again, FY19 was a little bit of an outlier, um, but increasingly the Department of Defense has had to rely on long continuing resolutions uh, to fund its operations. That has both the consequence on the prohibition of new starts or undertaking new activity that was previously mentioned, but it also means that once Congress does reach a final deal for the year, there's less time to spend the money that comes out of that final bill. So that's a little just sort of more um, budget context for what we're talking about here. I want to talk a little bit now about the political consequences of um, the kind of information that this really great report gives us, um, both thinking about Congress and thinking a little bit about electoral politics, which, as Mike says, is how I spend a lot of my time. 
So in terms of thinking about Congress, um, it's obviously really logical that defense spending will be more politically salient in areas where there's more of it. But what um, folks in political science who have done research on these questions have found is that it's not just kind of levels that matter, it's also the relative dependence of different areas on that activity. So it's not, you know, we're we talked before about kind of the top 10 uh, states by absolute amount of spending. There's also really great data in the report on the top 10 states by share of GDP that is represented by this, um, this kind of activity. And that, it turns out, seems to be what's really important for uh, members of Congress and thinking about their behavior based on the presence of um, military spending in um, their districts. So when you, and this is particularly true for rural areas, which are likely to have less diverse economies and may have a greater share of their economic activity um, connected to this um, defense spending. And so in these kind of defense-reliant districts, we'll see members of Congress be more active on military issues to seek out, say, membership on the Armed Services Committees um, in the House, on the uh, Appropriations Subcommittee that handles the defense bill. So we see more dependence in the districts on this activity, leading to more activity by those members, which then in turn tends to lead back to more spending. And so it's a little bit of a, a kind of cyclical um, dynamic. We also see these kinds of members from these districts with um, that are pretty dependent on this activity. Um, you know, they're generally more supportive of the military and military operations, even when, even as compared to um, uh, their colleagues who are similar ideologically, but not necessarily from districts that have a lot of um, of activity. It's also worth noting that the kind of public visibility of the spending matters. So when we talk about, say, um, why members of Congress are maybe less publicly or less um, seek out fewer opportunities to be on, say, the Intelligence Committee, it's in part because even if you have a lot of um, you know, intelligence-related activity in your district, you can't really talk about it. And so part of why a lot of the um, kind of um, activity that gets captured by this report is important for thinking about how members of Congress behave is because it's the kind of thing that they um, can talk about and do talk about a lot. Um, just a couple notes on how we should think about the consequences of this kind of geographic concentration for electoral politics. So lots and lots of research on does federal spending matter for, uh, uh, first on questions of how do kind of politics determine where federal spending goes? And there's lots of work on this, some of it done by my um, Brookings colleague, John Hudak, um, who finds that for certain types of federal spending, um, it's more likely to be targeted to, say, presidential swing states. But this, um, this research is a little bit noisy. There's lots, of, it really depends on kind of what kind of spending we're talking about. It depends on sort of are we talking about levels of spending? Are we talking about percentage change over time? But again, there's some evidence that voters will tend to reward the president's party when there's more federal spending of different kinds coming to their area. But at the end of the day, most of what we expect will matter for electoral and voting behavior is partisanship. So that's just a kind of fundamental reality of our contemporary political system. Um, just a couple of examples of this. We see, for example, very low levels of split ticket voting anymore. So most voters, when they go to the polls in a presidential election year, will vote for a um, House candidate of the same party that they vote for a presidential candidate. Um, there was a time as recently as the 1980s where we saw a lot of voters split their tickets. It's also true that in 2016, for example, was the first time that in every state that had a Senate election, um, the uh, party of the senator who was elected was the same as the um, party that uh, got that state's electoral votes in the um, uh, electoral college. There were no states that elected a senator of one party and went for the presidential candidate of the other party. It was the first time that that had happened since we started popularly electing senators in the early 20th century. So this sort of partisanship is really what drives um, voting behavior. But to kind of bring it back to um, questions that are raised by the distribution of um, defense spending in this report, then the question becomes, are there systematic differences and trends, the kinds of districts that are likely to have these large military presences, particularly when we dig into the kind of spending? So 
you know, what do we think about the kinds of districts that have a lot of military personnel versus a lot of contracting within types of contracting, thinking about R&D? What are other things we know about the kinds of places that are likely to have that sort of economic activity? And I think that's where we're going to see any uh, electoral, any sort of electoral story that we can get out of this data. But I'll stop there. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment on any of that or we should just go to the audience. I'll leave the politics to the analyst. <laughs> thought that might be your preference. Uh, so uh, thank you all for uh, your questions. So please wait for a microphone and identify yourself after I call on you. And uh, we'll start here in, I think I see two hands uh, right next to each other. Let's take both those and then come back to the panel. I guess there are three. We'll take three in that cluster and then come back. Uh, Sergey Kostev, PhD student, uh, Rutgers University, New Jersey. So uh, how much in percent is like when uh, dependence becomes important? So for instance, New Jersey, I looked it up, has 1.1% of defense spending. So I guess it's not important. So what percent is important? Like three, 2.5, things. I know how you're going to answer that. Uh, 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 go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Scott Mossiani with Federal News Network. Um, I think one of the interesting things about this is also a study in, in lobbying, it seems. I mean, the Congress, as you pointed out, is, has a certain cyclical uh, uh, part of this, and uh, they also have the ability to make the uh, pie bigger if they need to. Uh, I was just wondering if you could give me some of your uh, thoughts on how this sort of feeds the military-industrial complex, and at, at what point uh, does this kind of become you know, too much in some areas or too less in some areas. That's probably more for Molly, and then we'll take one more and see. Hi, Patrick Theros from Retired Foreign Service Officer. Uh, is there any way to break out defense exports from uh, this document, or is there someplace else to go? So would you like to start with any of those that you want to tackle? Uh, so I'll try to grab uh, two or three of those. So uh, on dependencies, um, we have an internal working number that if, if you're roughly one and a half times the national average, we would consider you to have a dependency on defense spending. Now, that may have absolutely nothing to do with if you know defense amounts to a lower percentage of spending locally if it's spent on something that's really important. And what does that mean? Is it spent on something that's significant for national defense or national security? Is it something that's critical to technology or something that you're attempting to leverage locally or regionally to build upon for your local economy? So it's all relative, okay? Uh, but as I said, generically speaking, uh, annually we'll take a look at what the national norms are and we will internally say, if you're basically one and a half times the national norm, we would consider you to be uh, dependent on defense spending or that there's a greater preponderance of spending in your area, okay, if that helps. Uh, in terms of uh, defense exports, you can't really use this report to help with that. I think what I could do is offer, uh, off aside from this conversation, uh, my staff certainly could speak with you a little bit further about that and see if there's opportunities to direct you more towards the information that would be helpful in that regard. And Molly. So I'll try to take a crack at the second question and the question of kind of the overall amount of defense spending. So um, I think about this largely from a process perspective and less from kind of a substance perspective. Um, and I'll leave it to substantive experts like Mike to talk about kind of what's the right overall size of the defense budget. But I will say that one of the dynamics that we've um, found ourselves in for about the last decade, in part because of the structure of the Budget Control Act, is because the uh, BCA has separate caps for non-defense spending and defense spending, We've gotten into this kind of, I don't necessarily know if I want to call it a box, but a, a routine maybe, where the negotiations about how big that pie should be have been a lot about, all right, if you, some segment of Congress, wants a bigger defense pie, you also have to agree to a larger non-defense pie. And if you're someone who cares a lot about the non-defense pie and maybe would otherwise prefer a smaller defense pie, you have to be willing to go along 
with a bigger defense pie if we're going to get any sort of arrangement in place that gets everyone kind of what they want. And so that's sort of where we've been for uh, roughly 10 years um, under the Budget Control Act. So a really big question for me is, is what happens when the Budget Control Act expires in two years? Like, where do we go from here? And how do we, you know, members of Congress are creatures of habit, and they get uh, particularly if you've only ever been in Congress in this sort of budgetary environment, if all of how you've been socialized to writing the federal budget is this uh, routine and this setup, what happens when that goes away? I don't have a great answer to that, but that's a lot of what I think about when I try to think about this question. I'm just going to add a couple more points before we come back to you for additional questions uh, on this issue of defense dependency because it's something I've tried to look at over the years, going back to the CBO days. And when we did uh, a study back in the early 1990s there, during the drawdown from 6% to 3%, so national defense as a percent of the GDP from 6 to 3 in a half-decade period of transition, uh, we, we assessed overall that the effects on the national economy would be relatively modest, not insignificant, but relatively modest, and the benefits of deficit reduction could largely counter the loss of the, the stimulus the defense was previously providing at a time when the unemployment rate was higher than it is now. But we also observed, we did case studies on St. Louis, Missouri area, Northern California, and Maine, uh, because obviously, as Patrick was saying earlier, different economies have different kinds of inherent strengths and adaptabilities. And I think it was the economy in Maine that we assessed as having the greater <coughs> likely difficulty of making do without that defense spending compared to the choice as, as you went down from 6% to 3% nationally, and maybe even more in those three places since they all had high defense dep dependency of one type or another. So uh, I think those are the kind of numbers that stick in my head as well as useful historical benchmarks. We also know the Soviet economy went into a huge tailspin. It had been well over 10% of GDP uh, in the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s. Then they went through their period of shock therapy and, and uh, my colleague Cliff Gaddy wrote about this through the 1990s, and that was a horrible effect on the national economy of, of, the, of Russia in the 1990s, which took them a decade to begin to recover from, uh, arguably. And, and the very last point I'll make, which harkens back to an event we did a few years ago at Brookings, where I had the privilege of being up here with Ben Bernanke when he had just arrived at Brookings after his stint at the Fed, you may have heard of, uh, is that um, he and others underscored that in the Cold War, when our defense spending was also, at times, close to 10% of GDP, we had, in effect, a national industrial policy. We didn't call it that. We don't like to say we pick winners. But anything that was close to or dependent on the kind of R&D and tech advancement that was related to defense, space, uh, electronics, rocket engines, um, jet engines, these sorts of things could benefit from a spillover effect that came out of the defense economy because defense was such a huge part of the overall GDP, and defense R&D was such a big part of the overall national research and development effort. Today, defense is in the low threes as a percent of GDP, and I think defense R&D is something like one-sixth or one-seventh of the national total. So we're just in an era when the defense dependency of the economy writ large is still significant, but it's less than it used to be. So sorry for letting me uh, take that little walk down memory lane, uh, but I wanted to add some yeah, additional I, points. I, I would just add one item to that. If you, if you talk to the Defense Department today, uh, the notion of the industrial base is distorted. And it's distorted because of the number of years that we've been under the Budget Control Act. So we've been doing things on our physical plant and our industrial procurements that we would not have normally been doing if we had been able to regularly do things. So whatever is represented today, either in these numbers, you know, these numbers represent catch-up activity. So, you know, the physical plant that we have, we were not doing regular maintenance. So, you know, if you have to change the oil in your car, you know, on these installations, we weren't changing the oil in the car because we were dealing with other, you know, emergencies on these installations. So you're seeing some procurement activity beyond just weapon system procurements. They're trying to catch up to establish a new state of readiness across our installations where we have a hole right now. And the same across some of these other weapon platforms, we haven't had the money. And so the department's trying to catch up on a number of different uh, platforms. And, you know, what's the right number? Uh, I think that's something that the department's leadership is trying to grapple with Congress over. And, you know, they're worried that we're not at the right number. They're worried that we have vulnerabilities that 
necessitate greater expenditures, but how do we get there? And that's, that's the conversation that's going to be in the public domain this time around. You know, because we're saying we are trying to catch up on so many different fronts. How do we get there? Great. So let's uh, go a little bit in the front row. Let's, uh, the woman here in the fourth row, and then we'll go to the, up here to the second row. Do a group there as well. Good morning, Paula Trimble, Lewis Burke Associates. Uh, one of the things that we've seen as a big trend is this movement towards access to non-traditional companies across the Defense Department, DIUX, Silicon Valley. How have you seen this report shift and change as a result of that? Because seemingly, looking at the numbers, it's still the large contractors. But do you see shifts within the states because of those um, changes in contracting? I don't think uh, the report's been there long enough to where we could witness those kind of uh, fluctuations or trends. Um, we have to start dealing with more of the unconventional type of ways of doing business. There's no question about it. And artificial intelligence has a lot to do with that, too. And so we're still adapting. And so things are, we're, we're catching up on things. So I would be careful not to read too much off this data in terms of what that kind of, uh, the sustainability or the reliance or the applicability of those kind of industries are, because they clearly continue to be the source for the future. It's how do you best plug into them. As I recall, by the way, I think that for those kind of uh, areas, other defense budget documents have broken out the aggregate budget, and I think it's still in the um, single-digit billions, right? So it's growing, but it's compared to the numbers you're talking about in the report, which is $270 billion of nationwide services, it's still a pretty modest fraction. But there's not a real good way of, of still breaking that out yet. Yeah, right. Yeah. You go to the second row here, please. Bobby Pestronk, um, citizen. Our um, Health care related expenditures in this report, both for active and for veteran. And if they're not, what is the relative size of those expenditures in contrast to some of the figures that are shown here? Some contracts are, and some may not be. Uh, I, would, I would say definitively that we don't capture all of those expenditures in the report. If we are entering into a major contract with a uh, health provider or some kind of an insurance product provider, et cetera, those would likely be captured. Uh, some of the other expenditures would not be yet. And VA is not in there, right? Veterans right. Affairs. Right. 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 They are not. Right. On the other hand, if there were a military hospital in a given area, that was that the expenses directly associated with that would be captured. Right? Yeah, or if you, or like I said, if you sign a major contract with an insurance carrier or somebody like that to provide a service, they're going to show up on the on the procurement. And do you have a, a sense for the relative uh, in versus out? Uh, are most of the expenditures therefore in, or most of them are out because they're elsewhere or not captured? I would characterize most as being out to support what we're doing. Especially because the Department of Veteran Affairs budget is $180 billion a year, and it's yeah. all out. Yeah. So. Yes. Uh, Mike Stone from Reuters. I liked your Grand Forks analogy. It's sort of like a Wayne Gretzky skate towards the puck yeah. idea. They do that up there, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Minnesota, so, you know, hockey's... I thought that'd be line. popular, although he's Canadian. Um, <laughs> Is there a missed opportunity? Is there someone who skated towards the other end of the ice that you can give an example of? And could this be used as a blueprint for a BRAC? And last off, uh, what was your interaction with Norquist's audit? And was, if there was no interaction, was that a missed opportunity? Uh, well, OK, so there's probably three or four questions in there, right? So um, we are uh, part of the overall audit. And, uh, but as a component, okay? So the numbers that you see in that report uh, represent auditable transactions across the entirety of DOD, okay? And uh, auditability is your ability to trace, document, substantiate what you're doing, okay? Um, do we have examples of people going at, well, you know, the world is littered with a lot of examples of uh, particularly uh, 
uh, communities that are in difficult situations trying to chase economic opportunity and being taken advantage of. Uh, I would say, though, that around defense spending, we've been pretty fortunate in that most efforts have had a positive return on those efforts and people have not lost out. That's not to say that every once in a while you may, not, you may have an issue. But I think where we are today in the current situation that we have, the Grand Forks example is really important because you should take a look at those installations that are local. You know, where are they seeing the future? And is there something you can do? And you know, let's face it, if you have a local university or Votech school, if you have a vibrant business community that can tie across different sectors of the business side, and you have a public sector that can reach across a number of different uh, public entities, and then workforce development, uh, you can bring a menu of support that would interface with that installation and see where future needs might be and start, as we say, feeding what the future capital needs might be for that presence. Okay. Um, does that answer the three questions? BRAC one. Uh, BRAC right now, we don't have that on the horizon. Uh, is it a blueprint for BRAC? Look, I think what they did in Grand Forks is a great example of what you do when the building says, we think we may have a future use for that facility, but as of today, we want to hold on to it and maybe not do too much with it. So you have to make lemonade out of the lemons that you're given. Um, does that work everywhere? Sometimes it will. Uh, our job, quite frankly, is where that does happen is to go sit down with the community and figure it out. Um, I don't know that we're going to have another BRAC, uh, or if we have another BRAC, that's going to be the way it has been the last four or five rounds. Uh, Congress has seemed to indicate they don't want to go there. Uh, the building has not been spending money to do anything to suggest they're preparing for a BRAC or anticipating a BRAC. And uh, we still get a lot of questions from communities about could this close or not. And uh, quite frankly, the guidance that communities are being given is, you know, think about the installations you have and how can you work with them to improve kind of what they have. Because keep in mind, it goes back to that issue. I said they, are, they have a number of holes in them now because we haven't been maintaining them. And so they're relying on those communities to come up with ideas where they can collaborate. You know, how do you get the potholes filled? Or how do you get a new waste treatment plant? Or how do you get a new water treatment system put in? Or, or you know, new energy, you know, utility systems. So the, the, the premise right now is how do you help us become more resilient? We'll stay up here in the second row for one more, and then we'll look back a little bit. Hi there. Uh, Joe Gould from Defense News. Uh, great report and a, and a great panel. Thank you. Um, in 2017, the, the uh, year referenced in the report, um, there was some reporting, and also uh, Lockheed's CEO said that uh, um, a number of uh, lower tier suppliers were leaving the market. And I'm wondering what your data has to say about that. Um, and then secondly, if you'll forgive me a second question, um, this administration has been uh, very vocal about the um, sort of the economic side, the defense industrial side of defense spending. And I'm wondering if your data bears out that there's been a shift or if you, um, if we're not there with the data, whether you would predict um, that there, there'll be a shift as a result of the actions of this administration. Well, so, so the data shows that the administration is trying to catch up to where defense spending would otherwise have been if had we not been going through these uh, valleys of the uh, Budget Control Act, so these self-inflicted kind of gaps in funding. So, uh, you know, clearly there, there's additional expenditures going out to try to catch up, no question about it. Um, and, uh, you know, are they effective? Well, we're trying to now cover holes that were probably eight to ten years in the making and we're probably in the second or third year of really appropriations to try to, to fix the problem. Uh, where we are didn't happen overnight, and you can't fix it overnight. So we're on kind of a trajectory to address a number of the issues that exist, but we still have a ways to go. Okay, what was the, the second part of your? Did, did the, um, does your data bear out that there were um, a number of, you know, third and lower tier Oh, okay, right. So um, you can't necessarily uh, come to that conclusion with our, our report. 
Um, there is anecdotal information to suggest there has been some, some shifting. There's been some consolidations across industries too. Uh, quite frankly, that's why when this whole issue started up, let's say seven, eight years ago, uh, we started telling states that it was, you know, if they cared about some of those sensitivities or dependencies, they needed to start talking to those second and third tier companies, and, and they first didn't know who they were. So, you know, they, they started doing research and finding out who they were and then reaching out to them. And, you know, honestly, I don't think I would say that we've had anything that amounts to a sea change in terms of people leaving. Uh, what we've seen is primes working primarily with their supply chains and they've continued to be responsive more or less to the department's needs as we've gone. I'll just do a quick shout out. You probably remember, Joe, the uh, report that came out last fall. I forget which Pentagon office did it, but it was on the supply chain question. It was a classified or unclassified policy. Right. Thank you. Uh, Molly, you want to comment on any of this? Okay. So let's, I'm going to go in the back for a bit, maybe have time still to come back up front afterwards. But let's take all three of those hands. See if we take them all together or if it's more natural to answer one by one. Hi, uh, Tony Bertuca with Inside Defense. Uh, we're having this discussion as the Defense Department has just sent a $12 billion MILCON list to Congress, potential programs that might be delayed uh, in order to build the wall. They want $3.6 billion to do that. Um, sort of for Ms. Reynolds, how should we view the discussion around this data and this subject, given the congressional heartburn around 2808? And then uh, for Mr. O'Brien, what kind of work will your office do once those decisions are made to review those decisions and the impacts of, of the $3.6 billion getting deferred? Thank you. Should we take the other two, or do you want to answer now? You. I'm okay. Okay. Sir. Uh, John Grady, Naval Institute. The uh, question refers back to OCO. If you're cramming all of your new spending on programs into one year, which is what they would do through that emergency spending stuff, what do you do to industries such as shipbuilding? And then the other part of that would be uh, Zockheim on the commission that studied this stuff, Roger Zockheim. He said that you need to rebuild the defense industrial base to do AI and all those other things that you're talking about. So you're in a conundrum there that's both congressionally set and DOD set. So that's a question. Then one more. Yeah, Frank Lockwood with the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. In Arkansas, our biggest county by far, a quarter billion dollars, is uh, Wachita County. Population uh, 23,868. How unusual is it for a small rural county to be so dominant in a state? Do you see that other places? And uh, should these folks be worried, do you think? Do so you want to start with any of those? I'll let Molly talk to, okay. the, to the wall question. Go ahead. <laughs> so I'll start with, um, with your question about um, the list that was, I think, released yesterday. Um, on uh, MILCON projects from which funds would be diverted um, to uh, support construction of a barrier on the southern border. I mean, I think what's really important to, I mean, this is part of why I started my comments with talking about um, the BCA is that we have lots of moving parts and it's important to keep them all in mind at the same time. And so the same members of Congress who are thinking about, um, you know, making choices about the defense budget for next year, you know, how to approach how much to raise the caps by are also the same members of Congress who have to decide, you know, is there a Milcon project in my district that is going to get money diverted from it um, in pursuit of uh, construction of a of a wall, and so there's um, in in politics. You know, I often think about Congress as a giant game of whack a mole, which is that every time you whack down one mole, some, that doesn't go away; it just pops back up somewhere else. And so, I think your question about kind of congressional angst about what's happening um, in folks' districts around um, 2808 and those um, those particular projects is those are the same kind of dynamics that we're talking about when we think about you know do members how do members react and how, uh, how do they think about the relative reliance in their individual districts on, um, on military spending? I'll just answer one question before coming back to you. Also on the politics, the gentleman from the Naval Institute, it seems to me that the way uh, I would answer your question is that if the Trump administration were to get its way, 
with an OCO strategy for this year and for this uh, upcoming year and then perhaps the next year, uh, it could, in effect, be a successful bridge to the post-Budget Control Act era, at which point defense spending becomes, in theory, unconstrained, at least by that same legislation, which will have expired. However, the Trump administration has to convince the Congress, and especially the Democratic-led House. So if, in theory, uh, you know, even though it's not really the way any of us are supposed to budget, it could effectively uh, work. Uh, that kind of money doesn't prevent you from spending it well, even though it's not, again, not really the right way to to do a budget process, but in practice, I would be surprised if they get anything close to what they asked for, given the distribution of power in Washington right now. And my crystal ball doesn't see that far ahead, <laughs> uh, except to say that um, somehow, no matter how muddy this gets, we always seem to muddle through things, and we end up where we need to be at the end of the day, and people end up getting the right answer. And I've seen this for 30 years now, and so I've, I've kind of weathered the uh, defense conversion kind of slash peace dividend. Uh, we went through an enormous gut-wrenching exercise after 9 -1 and where we are today as well. Uh, now, nothing compares to the Budget Control Act, honestly. But uh, I think there's a lot of rational people involved in this, and I think uh, the lines certainly are drawn as they would be in any negotiation, but we end up at the right spot. Uh, the report Michael referenced earlier, there is a industrial base policy uh, report out on the integrity and the sustainability of our industrial base policy. There's concerns about it. Uh, the question that was asked earlier about are we seeing some maybe second and third tier folks leaving? Um, you know, there's concerns about how do you feed those supply chains to make sure there's labor sufficient to sustain those businesses, et cetera. And, you know, I would encourage anybody to take a look at the report that's out there on this, and it's a good read. Uh, the questions on the wall, our office doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, that's an easy response, too, quite frankly. Um, the, the wall is a challenge for the department. Uh, responsible people are looking at it, and they're trying to come up with the means to respond to the requirement as they're also trying to meet the needs of our forces. And I would continue to defer and look to our leadership for making those decisions. Uh, the question on, uh, did I hear the state was Arkansas? Is that the state that I heard? Um, Arkansas is, is probably one of the states I have in mind when I say I would look at that map and see, you know, some of those states that are not colored in the deep colors but yet they have significant presence. So Arkansas, you have Little Rock, and you have Pine Bluff Arsenal. And, you know, I was talking to your governor about this uh, just a couple of weeks ago, too. And, you know, you have issues at both of those facilities, and they're, they're the, you know, in some respects, the epitomize what we've been talking about here. So they've both been kind of the outcome of the Budget Control Act, and what are you doing across those two facilities to continue continue to make sure they're doing their mission. So in that case, Arkansas is stepping forward to work with both Little Rock and Pine Bluff. And quite frankly, they're trying to step in wherever they, they see that either the installation can't get sufficient funding or something is too great of a challenge for them to work through the mechanisms they have. Can the state or the community step up to help buttress it? So you epitomize in Arkansas what you should be doing, which is where is the concentration of employment, what accounts for it, and then go sit down and talk, either if it's an installation, talk with the garrison or the wing commander, understand what their needs are and what can you do to help them. Uh, Kentucky, of all places, right? So Michael talked about Kentucky at the onset. Uh, Kentucky's been bending over backwards to figure out what can they do to help their installations. And those installations, and collectively across the state, they may not account for one of the top 10 states, but they're really critical to Kentucky's well-being, and they embrace them. And so they're engaging at whatever levels do exist, and they view them as being a top 10 employer, regardless of whether they are or not, given the stats in this, in this guide. Okay. okay, so I see three more hands. Maybe we'll take those three and then come back for final answers and concluding remarks. Woman here in the sixth row, and then two hands up front, please. 
Hi, I'm Meredith from Convert Strategies. You spoke a little bit about the funding gap to address installation issues. I know in the NDAA recently you were issued authority to give grants. Um, does this report feed into your decisions, or how are those two programs kind of related? Uh, this report feeds into our decisions only to the extent that we find defense dependencies. And if states or communities are trying to figure out how can they respond to something, it helps us to, to educate states or communities on where to go to, to start looking at this and working with them to be responsive. Okay, um, Our grants are not represented in this report. Th those are, you know, it's a separate kind of a product. Um, and I would also say... Uh, there is a plethora of local officials out there right now who really don't know what's going on. And, you know, I have had visits from mayors, et cetera, when they've been given pink slips and they come in and they're, they're reacting. And what we're trying to do is put this data out there and say, uh, don't, you know, there, there's a benefit to being a little bit more preemptive or proactive. Know about this stuff before it comes back to bite you. And know that there's uncertainty. You know, there's still two years left of the Budget Control Act. I don't know what's going to happen after it. Maybe we get to a period of normalcy. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, we all tell you can ignore both to execute the laws of the land. And, you know, our responsibility is to execute those laws to make sure we still feel the national defense. And that's what we're going to do. So up here, I'll go to the, the front row and then to the second row. We'll take those two together and then wrap up. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for coming by to have this discussion. Uh, my name is Neil Shaban. I'm with the American Legion. And uh, kind of on the basis of, you know, as it goes, you only remember what you remember. So uh, if you had to say, like, what are your takeaways from this from this massive, like, you know, discussion, especially in the terms of when we're trying to reference these questions afterwards, like leaving here, we're going to look to this book, uh, this, this report. So what is in this, what is not in this report that you would say needs addressing? Um, and how do you say that we should find that information? So what can we take away from this book versus what's not in this book that needs to be addressed? And then gentlemen in the second row. Hi, Michael Bruno with Aviation Week. And I'm curious, going back to the BRAC question, is there any way to tie this data that you do to the 22% figure that DOD says is unnecessary infrastructure or the GAO's high-risk list? Spending or are those just totally different data sets and you can't tie them together? I would say they're different. I don't, I don't think you can tie this to any of that information. I mean, you can if you're aware of what's going on locally and, and you know, you have awareness of your installation. Uh, you can go look at installation up in here and start trying to figure out what has been the, the procurement levels and the personnel levels at an installation going back as far as you can go. But I don't think you can draw any other uh, conclusions on that. I would be careful not to. You know, at the end of the day, uh, that 22 percent may or may not have anything to do with mission readiness, and military value is something completely different. And, you know, the current Secretary of the Air Force was very adamant that just because you're, you're at a certain percent of, of uh, underuse or underutilization, that doesn't mean that you're not a gem in the, in the you know, national security crown jewel, and, and we have to have you. So I would be very careful not to read too much in that vernacular out of this report. Uh, the number one problem that, or the number one challenge for the first question is the supply chains. Uh, what happens to that money? Um, you know, what happens if you're at, at Kwanzaa Point and you know the money's coming to you from Groton and you're trying, or wherever it's gonna come from, uh, what are you going to do about it? Or you know, how resilient are those facilities to continue to build submarines or, or surface ships? And uh, what are the supply chains that rely on? Are those supply chains in your state? Are they beyond your state in the region? And, you know, we've seen a lot of synergies when the states of New England have bonded together to start thinking about, you know, there's a lot of synergy across supply chains for every one of our major manufacturers, regardless of what state they're in. So in some respects, getting aside from the parochialisms of being a state and talking about regions and saying, you know, I've got, I'm in Connecticut, but somebody that's really critical to my manufacturing base is, is in Massachusetts. And, you know, we, we used not to spell Massachusetts, let alone talk to them. And now, you know what, we spell it and we talk to them because we, we can't afford not to. So the one piece that's not in here, and it probably will never get in here, 
is a greater awareness of those supply chains. And you're only going to get there by actually doing the dig yourself or through your folks at the local and the state level to go out and start working it. Molly, any reactions you would have to this question, which is a good one to sort of start to wrap up on? Yeah, no, I mean, the one thing I would say is just that um, I this is really great uh, data, and I would just commend you and your team to keep producing it. You know, there's, to the extent that um, we can start to use data like this to understand other political questions, the kinds of questions that I look at in my work, um, over time analysis is so important, and being able to look at sort of how things change from year to year, thinking about the Budget Control Act and its future, um, I think that's really important. So that's not so much what's not in this specific report, but just an accommodation to keep up the good work. And I would just add one last point on this as well, which is that you may want to wrap up then if you have anything else to say, uh, Mr. O'Brien. But uh, what I think of some of the points you made today about different parts of the country that needed to think about their comparative advantages. I think of some of the projects here at Brookings in Metropolitan Studies and elsewhere. Uh, for example, Mark Muro did a beautiful piece on Colorado a few years ago looking at how uh, Colorado could leverage <laughs> the presence of, uh, of uh, Colorado Springs with U.S. Uh, uh, Northern Command and uh, Air Force Space Command, maybe now uh, uh, integrated unified command for space, and think about how to leverage the fact that it had a lot of good scientists and firms already supporting that defense industry, but try to make Colorado more of a global center of excellence for space launch in general, including on commercial sides of things. And and I've, we've had other colleagues at Brookings who have tried to get specific on how do you take an advantage you've got with one set, could be a university, could be a military base, could be a military research facility, sort of a, a gem in that local economy, and build on it, and somehow also get the private sector more generally to see opportunities for partnerships. So to me, uh, the idea of where you can do public-private partnerships is a natural a research question that this report can help facilitate. It's not really the one you would expect the report to solve or answer on its own, but it provides a lot of the grist and the data to allow that kind of analysis to proceed. And with that, I'll stop and see if you have any final uh, valedictory uh, words here for us. And again, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Sure. I, uh, I want to also thank you and your, your uh, co-researcher uh, and the other researchers in the audience. Um, you have to continue to look at this. You have to continue to mull through it, and you have to continue to look at correlations. And I'm not talking about just statistical correlations. Um, I'm talking about geospatial correlations, et cetera, too. Um, there's a lot of work that can be done in this, and my office is not going to do that work. We feel our role is to put the information out there, put it out there in an unvarnished sort of way, and let you have at it. Okay? A couple other things. First, uh, cyber. Okay, artificial intelligence is really important for the future. Cyber is critically important also. Okay, so um, some years ago, there was this uh, news article about somebody being behind the wheel of, let's say it's a Jeep Cherokee, I'm not sure what vehicle it was, and all of a sudden someone was able to hack into it and take control of it, and, and you know, all of a sudden somebody else was controlling it, and they could have been miles away or, or countries away. Um, cyber is an important vulnerability, okay? It's a vulnerability that the uh, states and communities are looking to catch up on. So those supply chains that I mentioned earlier that we don't have a full definition of here, but which gets identified through additional work, those supply chains are vulnerable to cyber. And the department has criteria now to where we don't want to contract with them if they can't certify that they have a way of dealing with it. So look at those vulnerabilities because with those vulnerabilities come opportunities to educate a local workforce to become smart on it and to support our efforts to thwart or to prevent further cyber attacks. Okay, the, the second part of this is workforce development. Okay, and this isn't just unique to the manufacturing world. Okay, Workforce development in this country has to catch up where the technologies are going and the innovations are going, and it's no different for DOD. So what's not listed in here are the skill mixes that are required for, for the personnel that have the jobs or the industries that are being contracted with. Okay, That's vintage business development. It's vintage tying workforce training with business development. And unfortunately, a lot of our experience to date suggests that workforce development can't keep up with the higher 
technologies and the higher skills that you have to have to remain competitive. How do you do that? You know, there's states have a lot of say in how things can happen. Academia has a lot of say in things can happen. So there's, there's items in that here that are not addressed, but they pose public policy challenges, and this information actually should prompt some of those conversations at the state and local level. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, and also invite anybody who takes a look at this. If you have ideas about either something that's not missing or that, that's not in the document or is missing or you think something could be done to improve it, we'd like to know about it because we'll make a conscientious effort to continue to improve on it. So there's contact information in here for uh, Tara Butler. She's also here. You can bring that to her attention. We also have Liz Kimanti, who, who is the, um, you know, I look at this as Liz's report. <laughs> Congratulations, Liz. Um, but, you know, Liz, Liz takes pride in how this report goes, and she's responsible for the accuracy of it. And uh, she does a hell of a job. And if you have inputs or suggestions, she's very open to how to improve it, too. So we welcome those. In just a second, I'll ask you to join me in thanking not only Patrick and Tara, but Liz as well. But let me first say the website where you can find this is www.oea.gov. OEA, Office of Economic Adjustment.gov. And with that, please join me in thanking these great people. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.